All right, looks like our number is uh, getting a little more steady, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our sixth webinar in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Green Stormwater Infrastructure Series. This webinar will be one hour and a half long and will be recorded and available along with the rest of the series on the Florida Friendly Landscaping website. Today, we will learn about swales and bioswales. Um, we will hear from experts from the University of Florida, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, as well as Ferguson Waterworks. And today's speakers include Dr. Evan Bean from the University of Florida, Claire Lewis from the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, and Jessica Brusso from Ferguson Waterworks. Additional information about swales and bioswales can be found on our Green Stormwater Infrastructure Program website, a link to which we will include in the chat. Um, Next month on August 17th, we'll have a webinar focused on design techniques. And at that webinar, attendees can, extend, can expect an extensive overview of GSI design. See the full lineup of webinars, including past recorded webinars. Please visit the Florida Friendly Landscaping website at floridafriendlylandscaping.com and follow the links to the training and FFL webinars. A link to that will be dropped in the chat box as well. This webinar has 1.5 credits for CEUs available for Florida Friendly Landscape Certified Professionals, FNGLA credits, floodplain managers, professional engineers, and landscape architects. The link will appear in the chat for CEUs. If you have any questions or issues with your CEUs, please, please reach out to Claire Lewis and her contact information will also be in the chat. A link to GSI funding information will be in the chat as well. And we have also recently launched our GSI inventory survey, um, which we're using to collect information on GSI projects throughout the state. A link to that survey will be in the chat. And when using that survey, folks can submit up to three projects per survey session. If you have any questions for today's speakers, please submit them in the question and answer box, as opposed to the chat box. That way our moderators don't miss them and we can make sure that we get to your questions. Um, we will have time after each presentation for question as well as towards the end of the webinar. Depending on time, if we're uh, running a little a little close on time, we might save all questions towards the end. So we'll uh, we'll kind of take that as it goes. And if we do have time towards the end of a presentation, we'll try to address questions there. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Evan Bean to get us started. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I guess it's a good afternoon. Well, no, it is good morning still. Wow. Long, long time frame. Um, uh, windows up here. All right. I uh, hope everybody can see my uh, screen okay. Uh, so today we're going to talk about two uh, practices, swales and bioswales, uh, two practices that are often almost, you know, probably the most uh, interused or interchangeable terms within the area of stormwater management. You know, so we hear the term swales and bioswales. And if you ask people, uh, which I'm gonna do now, uh, what is the difference between a swale and bioswale? A lot of times we get different answers. And so, you know, if you want to, uh, I invite you to put, uh, enter in sort of some of your, your thoughts on how you define a swale and bioswale into the chat uh, here so that we can kind of see sort of what the range of uh, responses are. I would expect that many people are you know, more familiar with what swale is than what a bioswale is. Uh, and sort of bioswales tend to be a little bit, maybe less clearly defined or less commonly uh, used, and, but the, the bioswale and swale terminology are often used interchangeably. Uh, let's see what we have as far as some comments here. Area you dedicate to direct stormwater runoff bioswales usually has a higher diversity of plantings focused on stormwater infiltration. There's good, some good responses here coming in. Swale may, uh, may just have grass like a ditch, but a bioswale may have specific plants or specific slope. Okay, thanks, Gina or Jean, for that. I will try to stay uh, close to the mic and hopefully not have too many audio issues. So let's start out first with what swales are, and eventually we'll kind of get to what bioswales are. Uh, so we're probably feeling pretty familiar with what you know a traditional swale is. We see these on the side of the road uh, in many parts. Uh, if you grew up in a um, an, an, a rural area, you may have referred to these as ditches. Um, I did, and we typically called these ditches. Now, ditches and swales. There's a little bit more of a technical aspect of swales than ditches. Ditches were primarily uh, to promote drainage from poorly drained areas like wetlands uh, and agricultural areas, whereas swales are tended to uh, promote drainage during storm events uh, and for stormwater runoff. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the geometry and characteristics of swales. You typically see swales as a trapezoidal channel, and we'll come back to that geometry here in some of the later slides. Um, but you typically have sort of a flat bottom and then side slopes. Uh, and we often see uh, that swales are grass. And we'll talk about why swales are grass and bioswales, as, as some of you have mentioned, uh, might have a, a different palette of plants. So when we're looking at uh, the, the, the intent of swales, the primary intent for, for swales is the conveyance of storm flows. Uh, and if we think about just from a straight up cost perspective, the, you know, the, the cost for a swale per linear foot uh, compared to the cost for a, uh, a pipe of a similar size is much lower for the swale. We're just grading the land and then establishing per press and, and keeping that there. Um, the, the primary intent here is conveyance. So there's not a detention. There's not a holding back or storage of water and then slowly release. At least that is not the intent of a, of a swale. There is uh, an opportunity for infiltration of that storm water. Uh, and this depends largely on the type of soils, separation from the water table that we have and so forth. This is kind of a, a, a view that is just kind of a, a, a lateral uh, along the, the profile of a, of a swale here. What swales can do fairly effectively uh, is to remove particles. So as we have uh, uh, water flowing through, it's carrying sediments, those particles can be trapped. Uh, as the, uh, the, the vegetation kind of slows that, those particles down and those particles can drop out. Typically with water quality, we're only receiving credit for the actual retention volume, uh, particularly when we're looking at nitrogen and phosphorus or nutrient credits, because that volume, the dissolved uh, uh, nutrients are not uh, as effectively removed from, from swales. And one other aspect you'll see, I'll be coming back to some of these characteristics a few times, the residence time. How long does water actually stay within a, a swale or in the segment of a swale? And because the, 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 the uh, emphasis here is on conveyance, uh, this residence time is particularly on the order of seconds or minutes. Okay, so keep these kind of in mind. When we look at a cross section, we see sort of that typical uh, tr uh, trapezoidal uh, geometry. We have the side slopes and sort of flat bottom. That flat bottom is where the infiltration can occur, and the side slopes is uh, sort of provides the, the depth and our, our cross sectional area there. Uh, now, this shows, shows a, a diagram of water quality flow depth. This is kind of where most of that water quality treatment is occurring. Because as water is moving through that vegetation, the, res the, the, the vegetation is holding back that water or slowing it down and trapping some of those particles. We can get lateral flow through the, uh, through the, the banks or through those side slopes. Uh, and there can be sort of biological uptake by the grass and vegetation. Uh, again, uh, the, the permitting or the crediting of the uh, water quality treatment, though, uh, is only from the water quality or water volume loss. Uh, in Florida. Uh, and typically, we are installing this, or these are installed on the in-situ soil. We're not bringing in different types of soil. We're not bringing in uh, any type of engineered media. We're just kind of grading the landscape or grading the landform and establishing vegetation on it. Now, swales are one of the unique types of practices here in Florida because it's one of the only ones uh, that is actually defined in Florida statutes. Uh, and so the, the, the actual text of that, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about that here and kind of go into what these mean, uh, is, is outlined here in, in, in the Florida statute. So some of these uh, characteristics are that they uh, basically, uh, hold on just a minute, my computer is having some issues. Here we go. All right. Um, so the, the top one here is that, uh, the first one is that it has a top width to depth ratio of the cross section equal to or greater than six to one. We'll go into sort of what that actually looks like. Or the side slopes are equal to or greater than three feet horizontal to one foot vertical, that ratio. Um, this also has you know, some of the other requirements. We have contiguous areas of standing or flowing water only occurs following a rainfall event. So this again gets to the point of these are re required not to be storing water or flowing water after storm events or storing water um, in between storm events. Um, it's got to be planted with or has stabilized vegetation suitable for sto soil stabilization. We'll talk about the, the emphasis or criticality of that aspect. 
that the vegetation is also helpful for stormwater treatment and nutrient uptake. Uh, and it's designed to take into account the soil erodibility, soil percolation, slope, slope length, drainage area, basically it's sized uh, for the, uh, the drainage area or the characteristics of the water contributing to it. So when we talk about this first part of it, it's a man-made trench, which has a top width to depth ratio of the cross section equal to or greater than six to one. So if we look at sort of the trapezoidal of a swale, the typical trapezoidal form here, we have the, the bottom width, the flat bottom here is the lowercase b, and we have sort of some type of a depth. So in this case, the depth is some parameter some or some uh, depth value x here, and we're gonna, just going to say it's one and a half feet, for example. That means that the top width of the channel uh, at the top of the, those slope banks has to be more than six times that. Okay, so that the, you know, basically in this case, our width would have to be nine feet. And this is not, this is not to scale, but it is essentially a, a, a diagram kind of showing you some of those dimensions. And the other aspect here is that with a trapezoid, it doesn't have to be that it's uh, basically the same slope on each side. In some cases, we can have different or steeper or narrower, steeper or flatter slopes on the left or the right here. And so the ZL and ZR are our sort of our height, our, 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 our width. Of the, of the channel that is outside of that base width, okay? So the combined base width plus those Z values has to be uh, more than six times the depth of the channel, okay? Uh, when we talk about this other side here with the side slopes being equal to or greater than three feet horizontal to one foot vertical, means that our, our horizontal to vertical slope here has to be greater than or equal to three. All right, and so the three to one uh, ratio is still fairly steep. Um, we typically recommend uh, that most green infrastructure banks really uh, be no steeper than four to one. So the lower that value, two to one is, is steeper than three to one, four to one is flatter than three to one. Uh, and that's really for maintenance considerations. As you start to get steeper and steeper, it gets more and more of a, uh, a liability or a risk of uh, for example, mowing particularly, uh, being on a bank and potentially turning over. Um, so here you see, for example, if we have a depth of one and a half feet, our vertical component here, one and a half, then our horizontal length of that slope has to be greater than or equal to three times that, so four and a half feet in this case. Uh, and that goes for both sides. Um, neither should, can, be, uh, can be less than that. And so when we look at sort of the comparison here, um, the top width to depth ratio, the cross section, you know, the, the B, the capital B, or that width there at the top of this B channel has to be six times that depth. Um, so in this case, if we wanted to increase or change the geometry here, we can make that channel shallower if we don't want to make it wider, okay, to meet that criteria, or we can keep the same depth and go wider. Um, now, the six to one uh, ratio, if we have just a straight V channel, that is equivalent to the having three to one side slopes on both sides. Okay, so you have the three to one side slope on both sides with no base uh, in the center, then you have a six times your top width of your, your uh, depth there. Okay, um, and with those side slopes, we can always go uh, flatter. Uh, we can go extend that, make that, uh, that slope longer. Uh, being greater than three to one, but we can't go less than that. Okay. Again, that gets gets into a um, a liability or health or risk area. Some essential equations, uh, and I'm just going to touch on this very briefly, just as there's sort of a a context. Maybe there's some some engineers who recall having some of this in 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 their training or used these equations in the past. Um, the most common uh, uh, design equation used with uh, swales and channel design and a lot of pipe uh, design is Manning's equation. Uh, we're not going to get into a conservation of energy aspect. That's another sort of um, check or another aspect that gets into a more complex design, but it is a, another aspect there that, that does come into play. The Manning's equation essentially relates the average flow velocity within a channel to the uh, dimensions or characteristics of that channel. Uh, and so we start out with our, our uh, 
essentially our conservation of volume, that our flow rate for our volume per unit time is equal to the product of the average velocity times that cross-sectional area, okay? And so if we have a flow rate and we reduce the area, we're going to increase the velocity, right? Or if we increase the velocity or we decrease the velocity, we're going to increase our, our area, all right? So with the Manning's equation, it essentially relates this first part of it, the 1.486 is just the standard value. The N is actually a critical parameter here because this is descriptive of the vegetation or the material that the channel is made of. And it really relates to the resistance that that channel provides to the flow of water through it. R is uh, what is known as the hydraulic radius. This is essentially your, it's, it's, it's analogous or proportional to the depth of the channel, um, but it's essentially the ratio of the, uh, the, the cross-sectional area to the wetted perimeter or, or the, the wetted, uh, the wet area that, or the, the sorry, the cross-sectional uh, length of the channel that is in contact with the water. And then S is the actually the slope of the energy gradient, but in a lot of a lot of cases, we make some assumptions, uh, and that is essentially the channel slope. So the slope of your land or the slope of the channel that is flowing, and we typically want that to be no flatter than uh, half a percent, or as you can see, 0 0.005 feet per feet per width. Um, so uh, when we look at the cross-sectional area and we're calculating this, going back to just just simple geometry here, the cross-sectional area of a trapezoid is, you know, basically the average of the top width and your bottom width, capital B, lower B, average that times your depth. Um, we typically want that bottom of the channel to, just from maintenance uh, perspective, from mowing, to be at least five feet, and I believe DOT may require that. Um, and that's because if you have just a B channel, it's very difficult to mow one side and mow the other side and not have some erosion or instability issues. Providing at least five feet of width uh, allows it for it to be, allows you to get a, a, a mower down through that, a riding mower of a typical width down through there. Um, and then just some additional kind of you know, calculations here. If we have different slopes of the side slopes, how we might calculate or chat or what our top width is and our, our depth and so forth. Um, so kind of going back to some of the, the, the governing equations here, the roughness really is important here because that uh, provides resistance to flow. Uh, it slows the flow, and so if you remember back to sort of our, our initial equation here, if we slow the velocity of a certain flow rate, we are going to increase the cross-sectional area, okay? And so we need to have more depth or we need to have more width or both. Uh, and so it's a, it's a critical parameter uh, in this case. As we increase the velocity, though, we also increase the force that is on that, uh, the sides of the channel. And so, for example, there are some channels that might just be uh, earthen. Uh, so they might be sand, they might be clay, they might be concrete. And based on the different material, they have more resistance, more or less resistance to the force that can uh, go, go be, be applied. To. And so your, your allowable velocity, how fast water can flow across that without causing instability and erosion, changes with what that material is, okay? So a couple of things to, to, to uh, consider here when we're looking at designing for maintenance. Number one, most of our maintenance problems are going to be due to uh, sediment in some way. Uh, erosion uh, coming in, too much velocity coming into the channel, washing out sediment or moving it around, too much energy uh, or sloughing off of a, of a bank where it's um, vegetation is not holding that, that material in place. Again, we want to uh, stick to at least a five feet width for that channel bottom for mowing. And we want to make sure that our velocities uh, stay below what the erodible velocity is. And FDOT is probably, uh, you know, has the most miles of swales in this state. And so they have sort of the, the if you will, the, the, the handbook or the manual when it comes to looking at sort of what our standards are for designing swales. Um, and so just kind of looking at this table of those Manning's N values, these are the values of the resistance or how much um, uh, sort of you know, resistance is to the, in the channel. 
If we look at sort of bare earth, that doesn't provide a whole lot of resistance. So our N value is pretty low. As we get into more resistive materials or covering of the channel, we see that that value increases. So for example, if we have sodded uh, ditches or maintained grass, we have that's maybe two to six inches tall, you know, we have a N value of 0 0.06. As that N value, which is on the bottom, increases, our flow rate uh, for a certain depth uh, goes down, okay? As we increase it further, if we don't maintain that vegetation for a long time, we're going to further increase that uh, resistance. And so if we have the same flow rate coming in, then we're going to actually change and, and increase the depth. Um, and we, may, we could, in some cases, uh, potentially overflow the, the banks of that channel if it is not maintained properly. Um, so yeah, a higher end value basically uh, conveys to more resistance and slower velocity at that flow depth. Um, when we're looking at allowable velocities, this really comes into play when we're looking at uh, non-turf uh, grass channels. And this actually applies to the bioswales, which I'll get into in just a moment. Um, these swales here, uh, if we look at the different soil types, uh, the coarser the soil particle, the less cohesive it is, the slower the velocity that can be applied to it without basically eroding it out. So if you look at stiff clays and hard pans, we can actually uh, uh, have quite uh, high velocities, six, four to six kind of feet per second there. And as you get into concrete and other types of materials, you can get even higher. Um, but if we had for sand, we want to keep those velocities pretty low. Uh, otherwise, they start to scour out. And so if you look at sort of our uh, our typical traditional swale, we can see that, you know, this in this case, we have vegetation that has not been maintained. We have a lot of vegetation here, a trapezoidal shape. Uh, and this is meant essentially for high flow, uh, high flow rates to kind of move through and convey that water. And maybe again, having some infiltration, there may be some benefit here, but overall, we're really looking at uh, conveyance. We are seeing that the vegetation is trapping and capturing some of this coarse debris that you can kind of see in the channel. Um, but that's sort of, you know, that's what these channels are meant to do. Now, as this vegetation increases, that's going to create more resistance and the flow rate and flow capacity through there is going to be diminished slightly if it's not maintained over time. Okay. So now as we kind of transition into, we kind of covered pretty well what a swale is. Now I kind of want to transition into what bio, bio swale is. And really looking at what bioretention is, to kind of go back to our previous webinar, if you remember sort of what bioretention is, these are areas of that are low in the landscape. They're typically meant to uh, capture runoff and infiltrate it into the ground. Um, sometimes if they can have an underdrain for infiltrating uh, uh, water into soils, they typically have sort of a you know nine to twelve inches of ponding depth. And they recover that volume in a fairly quick manner, within 24, sometimes 48 hours. Um, but uh, they can, if they need to, they can rely on underdrain to help facilitate this. Now, a and, and you might see sort of some examples of this um, in, in the landscape, you know, sort of a, a large area, not too different from an infiltration basin. Um, but one of the main things to look at here is just looking at the cross section. We're going to see there's a lot more in common with a bioretention cross section with an underdrain than with a swale. Okay. Um, and this is kind of moving forward. You can see, sort of in this case, uh, this is a picture of a bioswale where water or, or bioretention, where it is essentially an online underdrained bioretention field that is in a very linear configuration. There's not much of a difference between a bioswale and a linear bioretention with an undertrain um, that has a certain storage depth before it overflows the system. And you can see the, uh, the overflow outlet uh, at the end of the rocks um, uh, just before the crosswalk there. So looking at the, the profile of bioswales, these are, as I mentioned, essentially very similar to a linear bioretention with an underdrain. Um, so it's essentially like an online biofiltration. There's a certain water quality volume that when the water comes in, we want to have a certain amount that infiltrates through an engineered media uh, or through a BAM, a biologically activated media. Uh, and then that is captured and collected as it moves through uh, either into an underdrain or in some cases we have good 
uh, soil, we can let that uh, infiltrate into the surrounding soil. So that could be lined or unlined either way. Um, but it is uh, intended to be uh, online uh, within the conveyance of storm flows, so it does provide that. One of the keys here, though, is that the water that's, that comes into and is really uh, the target of biotic swales, the resonance time here is actually on the order of hours to days. And so that helps with a lot more of the, the water quality treatment. Uh, and that's why it, one of the distinguishing factors here. And if we look to a, sort of a cross section of what a typical bioswale might look like, at the surface, it might look in, in this configuration or this depiction, uh, you might see that it looks very similar to a swale. Uh, but because of the design and the way that flow is controlled, and a certain amount of water is captured and then is forced to infiltrate through that design uh, um, media, then we have the chemical, physical, and biological processes that can occur in that uh, material. And then in this case, for example, where we need to have, uh, we want to facilitate the removal of that water, and we don't want to uh, pond up or, or build up a, a, a mounted water table underneath, um, we have an underdrain here to help facilitate the removal of that. Now, uh, in this case, because we have a, we're controlling the flow much more uh, directly, the flow rates through the, uh, through the channel are not as high as a swale, okay? So we don't need to necessarily have that turf grass that is densely covering all the banks. We can use a different palette of vegetation, more similar to what we see in bio, uh, bioretention, okay? Um, some other uh, configurations that we might see, um, just ways, uh, some other schematics you might see in this case, uh, kind of very similar to what we saw before, but in this case, you see sort of your typical trapezoidal channel, and these, and you'll see in just a moment, these might be just vertical. We may not need to have these uh, vertical, these side slopes, because if we don't have grass, we don't have to mow it, so we, we can go with more vertical concrete. Um, uh, uh, sides there to more effectively take advantage of the uh, area we have available to us. Um, so in this case, we have an overflow. So there's a certain treatment volume that basically gets captured uh, here in the uh, above the uh, the outlet or where the um, where the overflow or emergency bypass is. Okay. Another sort of example of what we might see in sort of a, a right of way. In this case, this is a bioswale where water is coming laterally and infiltrates into the subsurface. Uh, we don't have an underdrain because our, our water is able to um, uh, percolate into the soil fairly effectively. Uh, I do want to make sure that we stay on time, so I'm going to skip through some of these a little bit more. You notice here, here's a depiction of basically uh, we have the vertical uh, concrete sidewalls, and this is another sort of detail of basically having, um, you know, our water is, is captured here, this treatment volume, it infiltrates into the subsurface. There is no underdrain because we have favorable soils here. Um, here's another sort of uh, example. Sometimes these are called stormwater planters or uh, green, uh, uh, green channels. Uh, they go by a few other names, depending on where you're at in the, uh, in the US and, and around the country. Um, some, some things to keep in mind with bioswales, the design factors, um, they need to take into account the basically designing for the peak flow rate. And so this is accounting for the drainage area characteristics, typically your impervious area and the typical rainfall intensity. Um, typically, we're looking at a peak rainfall intensity or volume. Uh, we also want to look at the slope and the cross section and look at the peak velocity of water that's going to be coming through. Because we uh, are looking to have a, uh, a, a infiltration and we're capturing it, we will have a sort of a lower velocity through the bioswale. Peak velocity and channel material will need to be used to determine erodibility and changing or changing the design to reduce the peak velocity for whatever our channel material will be. Uh, and then we want to dissipate energy at the concentrated inlets. Uh, so, for example, you know, this, this sort of the real risk area, you have this concentrated flow in a pipe and then it comes out and, and it spreads out. You need to make sure that the energy that's coming out doesn't scour out the sediment or the vegetation right in front of that outlet or inlet. Uh, and then the storage depth and band properties will cover basically or determine the recovery duration of bioswales. And this is typically, again, within 24 to 48 hours. Um, you can see here just sort of an example of a, of a bioswale retrofit. 
where essentially water is able to go into the bioswale. Uh, there is sort of a, a, a pretreatment or a forebay where water is, you know, comes in concentrated, then it spreads out and goes over a weir into that vegetation. Pretty densely vegetated here, a lot more of, of, of shrub-like material rather than turf grass or dense vegetation. Uh, and then any excess flow would just continue down, whereas there's certain volume of water that has to stay in there that will infiltrate and be captured. Okay. Um, so looking at just sort of some examples of what bioswales can look like, Again, notice the difference here where we don't have sort of those sloped sides. We have sort of vertical uh, uh, concrete in this example. Uh, they use different uh, uh, cells or segments uh, to step down the, the water uh, as it overflows these check dams and, or these breaks in the, um, uh, in the, the, the linear system here. Um, notice the uh, stone at the pipe outlet. Uh, here in the bottom, basically water can kind of come through here in this pipe, but then it spreads out you just need to make sure there's not erosion that's occurring there. And also take note that we're using pretty large vegetation with some of these trees here. Uh, and it's a mixture of, you know, grasses or, or bulrush actually in here, as well as um, some mulch in this case was, um, was pine straw. Differentiating, kind of maybe putting a, an end cap on this, differentiating between the swales and bioswales, just to kind of think about that. Swales are intended for conveyance. Uh, we do get some retention and filtration, uh, but it's not intended to detain that water or to hold it after a storm event. It's really only meant to flow during and immediately after a storm event. We do have, it, comparing that with bioswale, we have online treatment, and that is the primary uh, 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 emphasis of bioswales, remove sediments, pathogens, and nutrients, because that water is, that treatment volume is going through an engineered media designed to remove and facilitate removal of those pollutants. Uh, secondarily, in some ways, is the conveyance. Uh, we do want to make sure the conveyance occurs because that is a fundamental function, but, you know, that is sort of the, uh, the, the online treatment is the uh, is the more the driver of the design and the conveyance is just bypass if there's not enough storage volume or capture volume available. With infiltration in, in swales, this is passive um, through soil into the subsurface. That's where we get the retention volume if there is any credit. With the bioswales, this is going into a biologically activated media. There's going to be an underdrain in most cases, particularly since we have high water tables in most areas of Florida. Uh, and we're, if we're putting this in for water quality, we are not able to infiltrate. So we want to, we're going to have some limitations that we want to catch that water and, and send it down. Um, you can have passive exfiltration below if there's not any concern with the uh, uh, mound of water table. With the superficial flow or the flow that's going through sort of what's above the, the soil and the media, on the swales, we're getting physical filtration of sediments. Um, but we're not having long-term standing water. Whereas with the surface on bioswales, we might see that we have a ponding depth that allow, that's allowed to recover for 24, 48 hours. Uh, and this is important to, con to consider when we're specking out the vegetation. So we want to be able to, you know, it's going to be more like what we see from bioretention. Uh, and then overflow structure to allow for those excess flows that would then tie in with the, any water that's collected from the underdrain. Vegetation, um, there's going to be more that kind of, uh, I'm sure Claire's going to touch on this a little bit more in, the, in later on in this segment. Um, but typically in the swales, it's important to have dense vegetation, grass, because the, the function is to prevent erosion uh, and to filter the sediment and slow the velocity. Whereas the function of vegetation in bioswales is essentially to take up pollutants, slow the flow, uh, and basically take up water and help to recover that volume. Uh, and then again, sort of one of the main factors here is your residence time in swales, seconds to minutes, whereas bioswales, we're really looking at hours to days. So a lot of longer residence time, really that kind of translates a lot of times to better water quality treatment. Uh, and that's, that's sort of that. So I, I went a little bit over here. I'm going to hold off on questions and really just kind of, we can maybe kind of take some of those at the end. And if there's um, maybe some questions or comments, I can try and address those. Um, during maybe some of the other uh, uh, speakers. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Thank you, Evan.
All right. Um, and with that, we'll uh, pass it on over to Claire Lewis with Florida Friendly Landscaping. Okay, thank you very much. And go ahead and share my screen. Um, can you see my screen okay, Nathan? Yeah, we can. Perfect. Okay. Um, hello again, and uh, thank you. I'm Claire Lewis with the Florida Friendly um, Landscaping Program, and I um, work within the Florida Friendly Communities as the statewide coordinator, and I'm really happy to be here today and, and talking about swales and bioswales. So I'm going to jump right into it. Um, Dr. Bean just gave a great overview of swales and bioswales, and now I'm going to talk about some things to keep in mind when we're planting um, and maintaining those swales. And um, so uh, it, as far as the slide goes, you know, they're, they're really, the guiding principle is to manage that stormwater runoff um, closer to the source and, you know, direct it to where you wanna go. Plants can be used to slow and filter that water as, as Dr. Bean mentioned. And, um, and um, so I'm gonna just jump right into talking about grassed swales. Um, their main function, as Dr. Bean said, is water conveyance, moving that water from you know, point A to point B. Um, but in addition, grass swales do a great job of capturing and filtering particulates. And in those images that he showed, you could see where it was capturing some of the debris and things like that. So um, while it might not look great, it still functions the way it's supposed to function like that. Um, and it also um, is, um, um, you know, great at filtering out those particulates. Um, and so turf um, within those swales is also great at, you know, um, you know, slowing, filtering, and preventing runoff. And these are just some different examples. And as the, the slide says, usually you're not seeing trees in, in most of these swales. Um, you know, you might see some planted high, but um, for, for the grass swales, usually, you know, you don't have too much in there besides turf grass. And so some things to keep in mind as you design and specify your swale for, um, you know, planting is, you know, make sure you're, you know, of your hardiness zone, make sure you're aware of that, um, your light availability, and your soil conditions. Um, the types of turf grass that we see mostly in swales is, is really Pensacola Bahia grass is the most common. You'll also see some Argentine sometimes, and then centipede, they can use that up, you know, in more of the panhandle of, of North Florida. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on, you know, some of the pros and cons of, of the different Bahia grasses. So Argentine Bahia grass is, it's a relatively dense sod. It has a dark green color and it produces a uniform turf grass area. Um, it's a wider leaf blade than Pensacola. It has good, they both have good insect and disease resistance. Um, but Argentine is also, um, and it'll lose its color sooner than, than um, Pensacola in this, this cooler, this cooler um, when the cooler weather comes. Pensacola, which I, I mentioned, you know, we, we see that more in the right of ways and in swales, it produces more seed heads than Argentine, um, which reduces the desirability for a long turf grass, but it makes it suitable for these roadside plantings. It has longer, narrower leaf blades that you can see right here. And um, um, it holds color though um, for, you know, or it should, I should say it loses its color quicker than the um, Argentine and other behavior grasses. And um, when you are specifying your sod, you're gonna wanna specify a sand-based or a seed um, for these swales. And then, you know, why, why you ask, why do you use a sand-based versus a muck? Um, because on initial appearance, this muck like is a lot better looking than the sand-based sod. Um, but the sand-based sod is generally considered to be of higher quality and more desirable for a few reasons. And the first is that sand-based, oops, sorry, I just touched the wrong button there. Um, first, sand-based soils tend to drain more quickly, which helps prevent standing water and reduces the risk of disease. Um, sand-based soils are generally more stable, meaning that they're less likely to shift or settle over time, which can be important for, you know, maintaining these swales and the slopes that Dr. Bean was talking about. Um, Muck-based sods, on the other hand, are um, typically less desired because of the organic matter, matter in the soil can break down over time, leading to settling and, uh, and 
evenness in the sod. Um, Muck-based soils also tend to retain water more than sand-based soils, which can lead to waterlogged um, soils and increase risk of disease and, and um, pest problems. Um, most sod is harvested from pastures, so they may contain some, some weeds, which are difficult to control. So, you, you know, you're really going to want to inspect that sod when it gets to your site. And um, if you see signs of weeds, be sure to hold your contractor accountable. And, you know, you expect weed-free sod, you want to make sure you get that. And that's really important. And uh, as you probably know, turf grass comes oops, turf grass comes in large rolls, allowing it to be um, installed very quickly, um, which is great, and it gives you know an immediate coverage. Um, the disadvantage of this is that you know it's more expensive, and and the labor required to lay that sod. So in contrast, you can consider seeding. Um, it's less expensive. It requires less labor than sodding, but seeds germinate slowly, right? Um, it takes longer to form this, this uniform turf cover. And then the success depends on the seed quality, um, the, the proper seeding time, and the method of seeding. So you really need to get all those right in order to have um, a successful seeding of your swales. The best time to seed um, the warm season grasses um, in most parts of Florida is between April and July. This permits a full growing season you know, before the cold weather sinks in. Down south, of course, you can do it year round. Um, and when seeding, you also wanna make sure you use a jute mat or biocontrol to keep that sand in place and allow for it to establish before you know, it gets washed away. And then of course, proper management after planting is crucial. For seeded areas, keep the seedbed continuously moist with a light frequent sprinkling of water um, several times a day. You don't want to flood the seeded area or apply the water, you know, in hard streams because that can um, really cause the seeds to wash away or cause erosion of the area. So um, with seeding, you know, that initial installation is, is the tough part, but then, but then you'll have a very good product on the end. Um, and, you know, as the seedings um, grow and the planting re, um, take, takes root and grow, um, that's really going to decrease that watering frequency. Um, so you just really want to, you know, keep your eye out on the, on the little seedlings. And, and once they're looking established, then you can, um, you know, you can go back on that watering. Um, if you are installing sod, really the main takeaway from this slide that I'd like you to, to have is this, it should be laid within 24 hours of harvest. So when you're specking that sod, if that's the, the route you're going to go, make sure that, you know, you spec that it, it's, you know, delivered and installed within 24 hours. And that really um, helps to reduce the stress on the sod, um, especially in our Florida heat. Um, if it dries out and gets really hot, it's going to be stressed and, and much more likely to fail. Um, you want to dampen the soil um, prior to placing the sod, ideally. Um, you want to fit the pieces together as the image show, you know, don't leave gaps, um, don't overlap. And um, if you can lay it in a staggered pattern so that um, that when you walk across it, it doesn't move, you know, it holds itself together. And it's optimal to roll sod after planting. We don't see that very much, but if you can, that's a, it's a great practice. For irrigation, um, I'm just going to briefly, I just wanted to show you this um, schedule that we have. Um, and, and basically, though, with the Bahia sod, once it's established, you should not have to continue to irrigate it. So this is really just for the installation of the sod that you want to, um, for the first um, seven to 10 days, you want to um, irrigate it, you know, two to three times, just really short little um, bits of water, five to 10 minutes. And then as you know, as you move along into the next week, you can you can apply a little more water just once a day. And then down, you know, you can see the chart there. And then once again, keep in mind, once that sod is established, it's, you know, you're using Bahia, Cinevide, um, you should not have to water it once it's established. So in fertilizing, um, the main thing I wanted you to take away with this slide is, you know, there's no fertilization within 30 to 60 days. And in these 
bio um, bio soils and things like that. We really, you know, don't want you to be applying fertilizer if you don't have to at all. Um, we, we, you know, want to reduce the amount of nutrients going into these soils, not add to them. But um, just to know that, you know, these the sod when you purchase it, they fertilize it. It's, you know, it's it's good to go. So just, you know, don't make sure you don't add more fertilizer. And mowing too, um, just, you know, you want to make sure that you don't try to mow the sod until it's it's rooted in. And that generally takes um, from 10 days to three weeks. And you'll know when it's rooted in if you pull on it and it doesn't pull up right away. So, you know, just make sure you check the sod before you, before you start your mowing regimen. Um, Next, what I'd like to do is talk about some of the benefits of, of plants. Um, and, you know, so we just we just talked about turf and, of course, turf is a plant. But now I want to talk about some other plants that you might consider using in a bio swale rather than just a swale. So, um, you know, plants, they filter and they uptake nutrients. They increase groundwater recharge. And, of course, they improve the appearance of a, of a site. Um, they absorb noise. They can provide wildlife habitat, and also they can reduce the urban heat island effect. So there's a lot of really great benefits to plants in, in the, you know, in the landscape and on our sites. And what I'd like you to do with this picture is, um, you know, turf really does all those things, you know, most of those things too, right? But with, when you use these woody and herbaceous plants, you get a more nutrient uptake and you get better erosion control. And you can see that, I think, in this image here where we have our turf and we're seeing some erosion from this pond. But where we have our plants, you can see that they're holding that soil in place and you can see what a great job they're doing of reducing erosion there. Now, this slide demonstrates the root structure of turf grass. And, and as you can see in the winter months when the grass is dormant, the root structure is quite shallow. Um, but in the summer when we're getting more rains and the, the, the grass is actively growing rather dormant, you see that the roots also are actively growing and are uptaking more nutrients that way. Um, now you can compare the root system of, of the turf grass. So here's, this is a little turf grass and you see the roots there two other plants where really, you know, when you're looking at woody and herbaceous plants, you're gonna have a much greater root um, area um, and a much greater ability to uptake nutrients and, and provide bank stabilization. Um, and then when selecting plants, you need to consider the location of the plants within the bioswale and their potential frequency for inundation and exposure to high flow rates. And you also want to make sure that they're not going to um, block the flow too. I think Evan had a few pictures where um, he showed plants that might be blocking that that um, flow. So you want to you want to keep that in mind um, when you're designing these. Um, and usually the design objective is to improve the aesthetics of the swale. And when you do that, you want to match the existing landscape character of the surrounding area. So these swales can look, you know, they can look more natural or they can look more formal and ornamental, things like that. I, Evan showed a picture of a very urban, um, you know, bio swale. So, so there's a lot of variability with them and a lot of options. Um, and the landscaping treatment can range from native drought tolerant plants to more ornamental landscaping, um, as I said earlier. So just, just keep that in mind. Um, the vegetation can range from tall plants and grasses to short turf grass, depending on the desired application of the swale. Um, but any vegetation that you use should be both drought and water tolerant. Um, native and Florida friendly vegetation is preferred um, because its ability to uptake and filter the pollutants. Um, and as I mentioned, the roots of the vegetation grow deep to stabilize the soil and promote infiltration. Um, so those are, you know, as you're selecting your plants, you want to keep those in mind. We have developed this green stormwater infrastructure plant guide to help with that plant selection. So I'm going to show you um, an example on this next slide. Um, so this is from our GSI plant guide at list for bioswales. And you can see there's a number of plants there that offer a, a lot of benefits to the landscape and the ecosystem. And, you know, these include providing color and shade and providing habitat for wildlife and a food source for pollinators and, and birds. And, you know, when done right, these systems can be a real community asset. So, you know, the, the images of the plants are great. Um, so, 
in the GSI maintenance guide, we have the list of plants. And then we also drill down into each plant and talk about um, what the growing conditions are, um, where you might use it on, you know, within GSI and within the bank, things like that. So, so this manual has a lot of really great information and, and that is on our website. Um, some other things to keep in mind when planting the swale is, you know, of course, um, you know, the size of the plants and the sight lines. You don't want to um, block any kind of signage or, or you know, any you know, vision triangles or things like that. Um, and you want to make sure that the plants also don't outgrow their location. I think we often see that the ornamental bunch grasses, when planted, you know, close to a sidewalk or something like that, they can often they're blown to too close to the sidewalk, right? And and they you know they grow out and interfere with the circulation. So we want to be really careful that that we give those ornamental grasses, especially, plenty of room to grow. Um, you want to use a diverse plant palette that has a variety of colors and shapes and textures, and um, you also want to plant these pretty dense. Um, and, and the reason for that is really to compete with the weed competition. So, you know, make sure when you're specking your plants, you, you spec it for full coverage. Um, and in the documents I just showed you, we have plant spacing guidelines in that plant selection manual. So, so that should help you with, with, you know, accurately spacing your plants. Um, mulch is something that, you know, we don't need for swales, but we do use it in bioswales and mulch has a lot of benefits. Um, you know, it inhibits weeds, it stabilizes the soil temperature, and it reduces evaporation. For these type of applications, the, the type of mulch we recommend is really a tripid, triple shredded hardwood mulch um, or pine straw, and then use rocks in those areas of erosion that um, we saw some really nice images from Dr. Bean's presentation. But so rocks, you know, where your velocity is really high, um, and, and if you can use an um, organic mulch in other areas. And, you know, as, as your plants grow in and mature, there'll be less need for mulch. So you can keep that in mind too. Um, first couple of years, you'll definitely need some mulch. Now I'm going to talk about irrigation again, where I talked about irrigation before I was kind of mentioning it for sod. This is really for more of the bioswales and, and things like that. So what you, you see is, you know, if, if you're, you know, you can use some drip irrigation, but I think in most of these, um, applications you see um, an irrigation truck like this. Um, so these are some typical examples of irrigation for, and once again, this is for establishment only. In general, the installed plantings require supplemental irrigation just to get them established. And then it's usually, um, you know, it can be tapered off and, and really um, you shouldn't have to irrigate anymore certainly after a year, um, could be after, you know, three to six months, but after a year, you shouldn't have to irrigate anymore at all. Some things to keep in mind when you're prepping your site for, for planting is you want to minimize the lot clearing as much as possible, you know, minimize the, the disturbances. And if you do have any trees around, make sure you give them ample room with a tree barricade, you know, take it all the way out, definitely to the drip line of the tree. Um, install sediment control devices. Um, and then these images here are of some common invasive plants. And so you'll want to remove any invasive plants before you um, plant your swale because you don't want to be, you know, transferring those invasive plants to other places. And you'll also want to check that percolation rate. Um, okay, there we go. So and plant installation. So really, you know, when to plant and you want to plant perennials and grasses, they should be planted during the peak growing season in mid to late summer to allow enough time for the root systems to become established before they go dormant. Trees and shrubs should be planted in spring and fall when there's adequate rainfall um, to help them develop strong roots and, and leafy growth. Um, and next. Uh, maintenance. <laughs> so maintenance is the big issue, right? Um, 
And um, we want to, you know, make sure everyone understands that routine maintenance is needed. You know, these are not maintenance-free areas, uh, even the ones that look very natural, you know, they, they will require some maintenance. Um, we want to, in the swales, the grass swales, we want to maintain the, the grass to a height of six or nine inches. And um, you want to design with maintenance in mind. Um, and what we mean by that is if you bunch and cluster species together, that can make it easier for the maintenance folks to identify the weeds in the system and really understand that these are intentionally planted there because that is also a problem that we're having, right? Like is, is finding maintenance folks who can really take care of these landscapes with a, you know, with a knowledge base to understand what's a weed and, and what is a native plant that they, you know, might not, might not be as common. Um, you'll often see some plants outcompete others. So you might have put in, you know, 20 bulbine, um, but then, you know, say the iris is just really thriving in this area and it outcompetes the bulbine. And you'll have to consider whether you that's okay for you or or whether you want to try to manage that and and keep the bulbine in. But you know, I think just naturally we'll see, you know, some plants that really thrive more than others. You want to approve, you want to prune to allow for sight lines and foot traffic. That's something that's you know definitely going to have to probably take place. And also pruning around the inlets and outlets to make sure that you know your swale is still functioning properly. Um, and we have developed, Dr. Bean um, has developed a GSI maintenance and planting certification or a maintenance certification training. Um, we are real excited about this. We just finished pilot testing that last year, and um, it's going to be a hybrid training with online modules and an in-person field module. And this is really, um, we saw a need for this as many cities and counties are installing these large green stormwater infrastructure projects. And then, you know, sometimes it's the maintenance that that's failing and not the system uh, itself. So, you know, we want to, you know, get people trained how to maintain these these systems. So with this, this certification training, there's a manual, as I mentioned earlier, that goes along with it. There's checklists for each type of different um, GSI system. So there's checklists for swales, certainly. There's checklists for tree boxes and for um, rain gardens and things like that. So it's, it's pretty um, robust, this, this manual and, and checklist. And also with the plant selection guide as well as part of that. So, um, and, and then one other um, thing that I'd like to go over is, um, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to find these plants that, um, you know, a lot of times we're using natives or, or harder to find plants sometimes. These are both really great um, resources to use. The Florida Association of Native Nurseries has a, you know, an, a website where you can find, you know, you can type in your plant and it'll give you, you know, who's growing it. This is for um, wholesale. So you have to make an account for that plant app. I don't think is, you know, I think it's open to anybody and it has natives and non-natives. So, so that's a great resource. And then one last resource that I'll mention is the Florida Friendly Landscaping um, program has several different apps that are all available. They're free. We have a plant guide um, that you can either download to your phone or you can access it through the web. We have um, a fertilizer ordinance app and a butterfly garden, bee garden, and a toxic plant app. And with that, I am wrapping up and um, I will take questions at the end too because I may have run over. Awesome. Thank you, Claire. Um, we had one question come up in the chat that Evan would like to answer while Jessica gets set up for her presentation. Um, we had Regina who asked, is it safe to say that a rain garden is a swale? Yeah, um, this is, uh, so no, they're, they're very different in their uh, functionality. Uh, and I wanted to kind of differentiate there. So swale, the, uh, the intent or the, the function that it should be providing is conveyance, whereas typically a rain garden is to basically capture and infiltrate or reduce the amount of stormwater. Whereas, you know, swale, you can have sort of passive infiltration through the bottom of the channel, but really it's just to make sure that water that comes in can safely be conveyed from one point to another. The rain garden is capturing and infiltrating that into the ground to reduce that runoff. So that's a, a, a key difference there. All right, awesome. Thanks, Dr. Bean. And with that, we will um, hand it off to 
Jessica Brusso with Ferguson Waterworks. All right, thanks, Nathan. Okay, so we're gonna go through this kind of quickly here. Some of it you've already heard from Dr. Bean as well, um, but I'm gonna discuss construction practices and also some available technologies. Hopefully, if we can advance, there we go. All right, so let's first talk about overcoming some construction challenges. Um, I think collaboration is going to be really, really important on the construction side. You know, we're putting in these practices that people aren't that familiar with for the most part. Um, so it's really important to have that collaboration. We'd like to suggest making pre-bid uh, means mandatory. So if you're going out to bid for a construction job and it involves really any type of green infrastructure, um, but we're talking about bio spills and everything now. So make those pre-bid meetings mandatory because the lowest bidder is going to win, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean they have all the experience in the world or they know really what's going on. Um, so when they bid low and they win that bid and then they go to construction and don't really know what's what's going on, it's going to make kind of a big mess. And then again, maybe that project won't be as successful because something's not installed correctly, et cetera. So we want to make sure that people know what they're getting into. We also want to explain why green infrastructure practice is being used. Um, so this is important for contractors to, to understand, to get that kind of more buy-in rather than just, oh, we're digging this hole in the ground, whatever, right? But we want to kind of stress and, and educate, right? It's our job to educate even contractors. Why not, right? Explain to them how, you know, all of this input, all these, this new input from um, roadways and agriculture, et cetera, and our buildings and everything else are, you know, contributing to pollution and to algal blooms and fish kills and different things. So, you know, it's, it's it can be helpful for us to educate people who maybe we don't even think need the education, but throw it in there. It doesn't hurt um, and it only helps to, to expand and uh, get that message out there. Explain what that practice does. So why we're using it, like the overall picture, and then what it does, how it functions, et cetera. Of course, if somebody's installing this, it's helpful to understand, you know, what is happening in this practice. You know, the water's gonna go from here to here to here, and then hopefully infiltrate, or it will discharge, et cetera. Um, so, you know, make sure that everybody involved does understand that. All right, so we've been through this already, so we'll go through this pretty quickly, um, but, you know, educate the contractors too on, uh, or whoever's installing, maybe it's your crew if you're doing something in-house, if you're a municipality. Um, so again, right, explain, this is what a swale is, this is what it does, right, this infiltration and nutrient reduction and all these really good things, right, storage. Most of the crews out there, if you're a municipality, will understand, okay, yeah, we have these swales because they're collecting stormwater, right, to reduce flooding, that's what most people think about. But let's go, we can go even further in that education piece. Um, we know also water should percolate within 24 to 48 hours. It is important to understand that and to make sure your crews know that because you're driving around and water's been sitting there for three days or however long, something's not functioning properly. And at the end, um, Claire just mentioned the whole um, GSI, the, the training and the maintenance um, that Dr. Bean uh, and uh, Claire had put together. So make sure that you know we crews can go through that as well but that's part of it understanding that that time line for uh, for percolation um so as claire already discussed plants are very important the right type of plants right right plant right place um so remember the plants themselves too even those roots will help with that infiltration right so those long rooted plants really help aside from just uptaking nutrients as well right so they help for infiltration and for nutrient uptake you can also um, provide built-in biases for large storm events. You know, we talked about the fact that you know, some will be designed with this, some won't, um, but we want to make sure um, that we don't ca cause a flooding situation. Um, so it's, it's by bypasses can be very important. And also explain uh, how the green infrastructure practice works, right? Um, so again, just go through the whole thing, really big picture to kind of the minuscule uh, to get everybody to understand it. And as you've seen before, um, this is just another cross section here of a bio swale, right? Explaining that there's that uh, line um, that uh, conveyance pipe underneath um, so we can get water to move um, and as well as infiltrate. 
Let's look at some do's and don'ts. Um, so we wanna make sure that areas are protected during construction, um, right? Get the silt fence in, make sure it's installed appropriately, uh, depending upon what type of area you're in. Uh, if you're near a water body, you might have to do a double silt fence as well, but making sure that area is protected during construction. Um, while we're digging, we wanna make sure, you know, we're not spreading, uh, you know, sand everywhere that we're digging out or, or soil everywhere that we're digging out. But we also want to make sure that certain things aren't getting in, especially if we're going for an infiltrative practice. Um, we have particular layers underneath. As far as media, so if you are buying a specific type of media, um, whether it be a BAM material or a specific soil mix or something else, make sure you're purchasing from a supplier. And um, so it does go through and meet certain specifications. Um, if you're manufacturing that on site, which means those materials are being mixed on site, uh, make sure that the source materials meet the specifications required as well. And store materials in a safe place and make sure they are covered up. Uh, it's the worst thing to drive down the road and see this huge pile of sand or media or soil, or whatever it is, just open, especially in Florida, especially in the summer when we are getting rain events every day for the most part, um, but making sure those are appropriately stored um, and that they're in an area that's a little bit further away from maybe what you're excavating, so it doesn't uh, go in there. Now, stone materials that you're going to use must be free of fine. So this should be clean angular stone, like number 57 stone. Uh, granite works really well. So making sure that that is clean and free of fine. So again, protecting it during construction in case there's anything else going on so that we don't get those fines in there, which would then uh, mess with the infiltration that we want to have at the end of the day. Don't compact the soils. That's going to be really important. Um, otherwise, you're holding water and not infiltrating. And then also communicate with other site contractors about protecting the asset. So on a large job site, you know, you might, this maybe just a small subset of that and you have maybe a subcontractor working on it but it's important that all the crews that are working around that area know what's going on that the assets protected um, so if you're putting in some type of special media let's say it's a high flow rate media again that's protected and we're, we're making sure there's not some type of cross contamination and anything again that would um, interfere with the goal right with the goal of infiltration or the goal of nutrient reduction Test your soils, right? So we need to know, is this an infiltrative area, right? Is it sandy underneath or is it clay, which is gonna be very difficult um, to then uh, get water to go down into. Where's the groundwater table? Um, so making sure all of that is good. And then of course, testing soils for plants can be very important too, as, as Claire points out. So you make sure again, right plant, right place. I'm gonna go into some available technologies. So, what do we want from our curb line green infrastructure? We want everything to look great. We want to filter pollutants, right? We want to get that water quality. We don't want there to be maintenance that we all know is not going to happen. That's real life. Um, be able to handle a layer of trash and sediment, because as we talked about before, things will come in and collect there. Um, but we can actually make this easier by using a pre-treatment device. So we haven't talked about that that much. Um, we talked about it a little bit, um, but we do have available technologies that will actually help with this. And not only do we want to collect the sediment debris, but we also want to work on energy dissipation. Now we talk about this a lot of times by you know putting in some riprack or some or some rock at the end uh, as the way to, uh, to dissipate that energy. But there are other ways we can do that too, more more formally. Um, so we can see kind of what happens to some of these, and these are not uh, bioswales themselves. Uh, they're more pictures of rain gardens, but the same thing can happen to swales and bioswales, where you know you have the scouring effect, you have erosion, you have the collection of debris, the collection of uh, trash and everything else. Um, so let's see if we can make this a little bit better. Um, so a couple of different options for pre-treatment. Um, so we have one modular option that would treat a watershed area of less than 0 0.25 acres, or we can have a more formal option that's it's almost like a mini baffle box um, with a greater acreage area for that contributing area. So what we do here essentially is put these in the ground. As you can see, it's, it's going to be the entryway from the curb into a uh, retention or, of course, a swale. And we're collecting that trash, we're collecting the debris on top, 
there's a sediment chamber that we're collecting. And this just makes it a lot easier. We're talking about, okay, we want to put things in the ground that people are going to say we're successful at the end of the day or that they actually like to maintain. So rather than having crews go through and pick out trash all over the place, we can centralize that. Um, you can see that there's one on the right hand side, which will actually help traverse underneath the sidewalk even. So if we can't put that bioswale right next to the sidewalk, we can actually move it over and we can get the water underneath the sidewalk into that while doing that pre-treatment and again, centralizing the maintenance. And again, here's that more advanced option. Again, I, I call this kind of a mini baffle box. It does have a baffle in it, it has formal wear, um, and it has a sediment sump there. So now collecting sediment and trash and everything else, um, and then letting the water get into that swaled area. Okay, and I talked about before having kind of the um, having some kind of a bypass some kind of an overflow structure. And this is one way to do it sometimes and you saw it in some of the pictures before, but we'll have a just a, a flat kind of grate. it's not raised up very much mulch gets in it. Um, so there's a better way to do this, um, so you can use a, a domed overflow um, and essentially. You can see here the picture on the right hand side that the mulch can then rise up a little bit and it creates a little a uh, little cuff around there um but it helps too because on the inside of this there's going to be a geotextile bag so now if stuff does get in and sediment or even some of that little mulch gets in um it will collect in that basket it's really easy to maintain this again we're centralized that maintenance rather than having everything go down that drain as we saw with some of those are, are flat those catch basins you know goes through the grate gets into the catch basin gets into the culvert underneath and now you're having to back out an entire system, but we can centralize that on top. Maybe it needs to be done more frequently. Yes. However, it's it's a lot less involved than you know having to clean out the whole entire system underneath the ground. Now we'll talk about a very a specific um, BAM media here, which is bold and gold. I know we've talked about it before. Um, pretty much everybody's familiar with it. Um, approved by all the water management districts. It was um, made by UF and um, can last up to 50 years for nitrification. Um, so we'll go through this. We can get up to 80% nitrogen reduction, 95% phosphorus reduction, 90% bacteria reduction. It does have to do with uh, how you implement it, of course. As far as nitrogen removal, we go through that filtration process. It's biological. That's bacteria doing the work. It has a very long life expectancy because those bacteria, they just keep propagating and they do their denitrification. Our phosphorus removal is a sorption process, however. So this will have a uh, less of a life expectancy, about 20 years based on the size. That can be modeled as well, um, but it's up to a 95% reduction. And also we can use BAM media for uh, bacteria removal as well. Okay, so in areas where bacteria might be of concern, we can see a 90% reduction in that. Now, how can we actually use this then in our swales? We can, we can use this in a layer in our swales, in our bio swales, um, and put a one or two foot layer, depending, that would be moss. And we've seen again that, that um, the modeling would tell you how deep you need to be, what that would yield for your uh, nitrogen and phosphorus removal. Uh, but you can see there it is right underneath. Now, as far as if you're putting, let's say this is a, a typical swale, but now we want some more nitrogen and phosphorus removal, but we're using grass, we can actually use a, um, a sod. It's a little harder to find, but you can find sod that's sand grown instead of muck grown. So you're not adding more nutrients with that soil and you put it on. And just an example here. Uh, this was a Cape, in Cape Coral, a swale retrofit project that did use bold and gold. So this is not going to be a bio swale, but you can use it in a bio swale as well. Um, so you can see they had the swale on the side of the road. Um, re dug that out there, put in the layer of bold and gold. And there it is after the fact, right? So looks very normal. Um, and, you know, he knows that there is fairly of um, you know nitrification and phosphorus reducing power right underneath there. Um, so that's all I have for available technologies um, and that and I looks like we still have about 15 minutes left for questions. So thank you guys for listening to that and I'll uh, open it up to everybody. Thanks, Jessica. Um, before we get into the Q&A, we are actually going to um, hand it back to Dr. Bean again, who's going to um, discuss some maintenance practices.
Uh, just getting my slides up here and getting everything going. All right. Well, just kind of kind of wrap things up a little bit. You know, um, Claire referred to our uh, maintenance training program, uh, and one of the underlying sort of frameworks of that is is approaching maintenance from a the three S standpoint. First one is understanding the function. So it's it's important for our maintenance approach to understand sort of what the intended function of the system is. So for example, with uh, you know bios with a swale versus a bioswale, if we think it's a swale and it's actually a bioswale, um, there's some things that we're not going to understand about the uh, the functioning of that system. And so we may interpret some things wrong. So it's really important to understand what the system is and what it's intended to do. Then we identify sort of what the failure is or how the system is not functioning as intended. Uh, and then we can essentially address that failure or fix that failure in that way. So when we look at that, um, when we're looking at trying to identify the function, we oftentimes will, you know, we're not on the site all the time. So we look at performance indicators. These allow us to essentially read the site or kind of look at sort of what has been the performance of the site in between our visits to the site. So the characteristics that we see are a result of the conditions in between our um, in between our our, our our visits. So some things to kind of look out for increased flow and energy can essentially transport sediments so we can see erosion or deposition and that can be we need to be able to interpret that be able to understand, okay, is there an energy problem here? Is there a source of sediments upstream and so forth? Slower velocities will allow those sediments to drop out and accumulate. So that's something to, to, uh, to take into account and be able to uh, use that information in determining what our, our maintenance action will be. Uh, and then plants are kind of the, to use the analogy, uh, the kind of the canary in the coal mine, the, you know, they kind of indicate when the uh, conditions are shifting, maybe to becoming too dry or too wet. And so we might see that the wet plants are telling us that it's been too dry when they start to wilt or dry plants start to suffer if it's been too wet. Uh, and if there's new plants that can tell us that there's a sort of a shift or possible change in the functioning of the system. And there may be something more uh, longer term shift, uh, a longer term shift kind of going on there. Some of these other performance indicators so erosion and washout. Again, that gets at sort of our excessive energy and flow rate. With the conveyance of swales, that's particularly of concern. We want to look out for that, um, particularly if there's a, a new erosion. So if it was stable and then now erosion just started, was there some type of a change that occurred? Ponding is another uh, concern, particularly on the swale side. If there's a blocked outlet, clogged soils, or if it's a bioswale, if there's an underdrain that's clogged potentially. Um, another aspect with bioswales that we, we didn't really touch on is, is ensuring that there is a clean out if there's an underdrain. So making sure that you can get in and vacuum that out. Um, rack lines are a, a great tool of being able to identify when uh, or, or how high water levels were in previous storm events. And then again, looking at our vegetation as indicators of performance as well. Um, we talk about sloughing and sort of the, the loss of, of, of sediments and erosion. Um, even though we could have sort of healthy vegetation, if we don't apply the right vegetation or we're not addressing the sources of uh, excess flow and energy that can cause us to uh, essentially you know, have these initial issues of erosion that can grow and become much broader, um, particularly if there's downcutting excision into a swale. That's a particular cause of concern because that can grow very rapidly. Um, if we're seeing extended water uh, ponding, uh, particularly around inlets, that can be an indication of excess energy coming in. Uh, and washing out and potentially causing finer particles to drop out in that space. Um, rather than uh, having very permeable soil, soil at the surface, we kind of get this clogging, particularly in this, this figure that shows sort of algae that can die and then clog the surface, reducing the infiltration rate as well. Uh, so making sure that we're addressing the energy uh, disturbance or the energy that's coming in and spreading, and, and, uh, spreading that out and reducing it. So with swales, um, you know, I was kind of thinking about it as uh, Jessica was talking about sort of some of the pre-treatment that goes in, and I thought immediately back to, I was glad I had this, these photos in here, because if you see the coarse debris here, the, the pre-treatment incorporating that in can really help to, uh, number one, not just help with the maintenance, but improve the aesthetics. Um, so if you're in a high traffic area where there is a lot of material or a lot of um, 
uh, debris or, or gross solids that need to be captured and removed on a regular basis. It's a lot easier to remove it from a uh, pretreatment device than to have to go through and pick it up or remove it by hand uh, on a regular basis. So if there's opportunities to, to reduce that, that can be helpful. Um, but in this case, particularly, um, there's a lot of overgrown vegetation. Um, and what happens there too, particularly if you're starting with a sod, if you have overgrown vegetation that can start to block out some of the, uh, the, the vegetation that is intended to protect the banks and provide that erosion resistance. That decreases in quality, that reduces its ability. So when you do cut back the larger vegetation, then you have more exposed soil. So it's, it's really important to kind of stay on top of kind of the maintenance there and not letting things get out of control. Because in those cases, it's you, know, you may have to go back and do some resodding or some reestablishment of vegetation. Um, a lot more involved than if it's you know addressed much more early on. The other aspect is just making sure that there's a lot of you know again di energy dissipation when water is coming in from those um, concentrated areas. Um, in this case, we have you know it, there's some issues with uh, the, the migration and movement of uh, of the mulch. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, of, um, uh, pine straw. Uh, this is a unique situation where essentially the, the pine straw was mobilized during a storm event and it accumulated on the outlet. Uh, and we were able to actually capture sort of some images right after it of sort of this, you know, there's sort of a unique opportunity where the, the material accumulated on the surface. There was some additional material during the storm event that accumulated on the surface, um, but it did cause some, some overflow. Um, due to the blocking of the uh, the outlet for the, uh, the emergency bypass. So just the importance of making sure that maintenance is performed on a regular basis or there is inspection on a, on a regular basis. This may not have been uh, avoidable just because of when it happened and how quickly the storm event um, occurred after the kind of the initial event that mobilized some of the, the material initially. But uh, if it can be removed, if it can be addressed, um, it needs to be done. And it needs to be done, particularly after this large event that put more material on there and you know, it's not gonna remove itself. So we have to kind of, somebody has to go out there and remove that so that flow capacity and overflow is there. Um, and again, we can kind of see, you know, we weren't there where we can see sort of the rack line that tells us sort of where the water level was, uh, how high it was, and we can put it in context, you know, how high, how long has it been since the last rainfall? In this case, it was less than 24 hours, so it was not a, an issue that there's standing water in this system. Um, so yeah. Just to kind of touch on or give, show you some examples um, of the inspection checklist that we have here. Uh, these are the ones that we developed, and we have this from provider retention, but we need to kind of modify it a little bit because it applies directly to our bioswales. Um, but essentially, it's a guide for anyone who's doing the inspection and maintenance to be able to go through uh, and uh, evaluate and inspect sort of different aspects of the system to be able to uh, evaluate whether maintenance needs to be performed uh, uh, on a fairly granular level. It also creates a record. So um, once the, the website goes live, we have actually uh, translated these inspection checklist over to survey one, two, three, so that this can be used by municipalities that maybe uh, you can use it in your field or whoever's uh, doing the inspection and maintenance, they can do it in the field, whether it's municipality or private entity. Uh, and that can be captured as a historical record of the performance of different systems. Um, so we have that for bioretention. We also have one for swales. Uh, and so those will be uh, available uh, on, the, on the website when that goes live. So with that, um, I believe we have some uh, some time left over for our um, uh, Q&A or just general questions uh, from the audience. Thanks, Dr. Bean. Um, yeah, with that, we can dive into our question and answer session. Um, so we will start with a question from an anonymous attendee who asks, are there criteria that can be used to identify a good candidate for conversion to a swale or bioswale? Jessica, do you want to touch on that one? You guys, uh, the, the example you had there? Um, a conversion from like a no, just a normal swale? Or? That's what it sounds like. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, if you have a normal swale anyway, right, you're, you're conveying or you're looking to convey probably. So you can probably easily change that into a bio swale. Um, it's going to have to do with capacity though, because if you're putting in plants, right, and vegetating that, you're gonna 
reduce the space or for volume capacity. So that would have to be taken into account as well. Um, and you know, you're adding larger plants, you're pulling out more water. Um, but you know, you can kind of calculate that too. Do you need to add an under drain or anything else? I don't know, Evan, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think maybe some things to consider or some limitations might be because a biosoil has a deeper profile. Um, if there's a shallow water table, um, you know, just kind of evaluating where that might be um, and considering sort of the making sure there's enough conveyance. Um, so, for example, if you can, if you maintain sort of the swale geometry on the surface and allow and, and basically increase sort of the capacity below it, um, then there shouldn't be a change in the hydrology as far as the ability to convey that water on the surface. Um, unless you have larger plants and you might be able to address that, you know, kind of account for that. Um, so those are the main ones there, um, but you're going to be, um, you know, those are kind of the main uh, concerns there. The only other thing I think I could add to that is just thinking about what maintenance you have available to you. Um, so, you know, because there are different levels of maintenance between a swale and a bioswale. So if it's a commercial setting, think about who your, your facilities people are. Awesome. Um, so another question from an anonymous attendee asked, has IFAS measured nutrient reductions by bioswales in situ? Uh, not yet. We are doing a study uh, on bio uh, bioretention with under drains. Um, so with some engineered media, so it's very similar in many cases, or in, in some, some respects there. Uh, so, um, you know, one of the things we're seeing there that is, is that it's really important to get the characteristics of the uh, engineered media correct, uh, so that uh, we're not introducing, in this case, we're seeing some phosphorus. Um, that was brought in with the, uh, the soil or the media that was uh, spec for the, the system um, to make sure that that's not a, an export or a source to the environment when we're trying to remove uh, nutrients. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Bean. Um, and then Regina asked, um, does your GSI site have a list of landscapers or installers for bioswales? Um, referring to the, the DEP GSI website, we don't currently have a list on there, but Claire might have some resources um, that you might be able to find something. Well, what we have is a list of people who've attended the GSI sort of maintenance certification. So that's may not be the same as installers. Um, Evan? Yeah, we probably, probably refer you to uh, an engineer to be able to um, a local engineering company to be able to design um, a bioswale um, to be able to then install it. So the design aspect is going to be the critical part there. The installation, uh, most construction, you know, who, people who do uh, municipal construction could probably do the construction of it. Um, so I'm thinking most um, you know, contractors could could install and 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 do the construction of the bios bios bioswale. Um, However, it's you know the design and getting the sizing and those characteristics uh, spec'd out is the critical part. And one other thing, I think on the DEP GSI website, um, on those examples, that was also part of the reason I, I think we were listing the people who were the engineering and, and the um, other contractors in those projects too. Um, is, that, is that right, Nathan? Do we have this on there? So for some of the projects, you can find um, contacts that were involved in the projects. Um, so so yeah, that, uh, the intent there is to be able to reach out and kind of talk shop with them and understand um, what they did to uh, to create a successful project. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, it looks like that is um, all for our question and answer. I want to thank everyone who attended the webinar today for um, your participation and your great questions. And I'd also like to thank our panelists for another great um, webinar in our series. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone, if you haven't already, to check out the FFL website and you can review all of the past recorded webinars. And I'd also like to give a friendly reminder that next month on August 17th, we'll be having a another webinar on design techniques. Um, so with that, I'd like to give one last thank you and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.